Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Michael Janich. Michael is the founder and head instructor of Martial Blade Concepts, a fighting system born of over 40 years of eclectic martial arts training. You also know Michael as the designer of the Spyderco Yojimbo, the Yojumbo, and the Ronin, and then a host of uh, a lot of other self-defense oriented knives on the market. The man knows how to fight with a knife, but he also knows guns, having trained with legendary close combat luminary Colonel Rex Applegate. Many books and countless articles later, Michael Janich is one of the leading names in knife fighting and close quarters combat technique and application, and it's always a pleasure to have him on the show. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, click the notification bell, and while you're there, check out my knife close-up videos, Thursday Night Knives, that's our live stream, and other great interviews with makers and personalities that make the knife world happen. And if you think what we're doing here is valuable and you want to help support the show while enjoying exclusive opportunities and content, you could do so on Patreon. Quickest way to get there is to head over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit thenifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Michael, welcome back to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Great to have you here, sir. Thank you for having me. It's great to see you. Oh, it's great to see you, too. So uh, last time we saw one another, it was uh, at Blade Show 2021. I love saying that because uh, this being my first year, I keep dropping that. Uh, but it was really awesome to see you at the pit and to have a conversation. And just, you know, we had a nice meandering conversation about a lot of things. And, uh, you know, it was great to see you in person. It's great to meet you in person as well. And Blade Show is all about nice meandering conversations. So you fit right in. <laughs> I just loved how uh, people, men and women, were running around that spot with big sheath knives and tomahawks in their backpacks and all sorts of stuff. That's just my my kind of crowd. Yeah, it's it's awesome. I mean, once once that crowd kind of descends and takes over the place, um, new a new definition of normal, but it's all really good. It's just a lot of good people who love knives and love everything about them. So you see a lot of cool stuff and meet a lot of cool people. <clears throat> uh, well, since since that night, you sent a Ronin to my way. Uh, I love this fixed blade knife. I told you that uh, I was a huge fan of the Yojimbo and then the Yojumbo, uh, and that I had yet to get one of these. You very graciously had one sent to me. And uh, I absolutely love it. I'm a daily carrier of fixed blade knives, and I'm totally sold on the Warncliffe and on your your blade design. Uh, tell me a little bit about what went into making this knife in particular, this Ronin. What's interesting is the the R and D process for that was about as dead simple as you, it could possibly be. Um, <clears throat> custom knife maker Mickey Ronin is a good friend of mine, and I was actually teaching out in Ohio and uh, Mickey lives in Ohio in Youngstown. He came out for the NBC seminar that I was doing. And at that time, the uh, Yojimbo 2 was brand new. So pulled out my Yojimbo 2, showed it to him. And I'm like, hey, check this out. And he's like, oh, that's awesome. And Mickey at that time was still a full-time law enforcement officer. He's retired now. So whenever possible, I always try to comp him the class, just make it as accessible to him as possible to support him and, and his profession as a law enforcement officer. So he's like, you know, I don't make folders, but here, let me borrow that. So he literally took the Ojimbo 2, put it down on a piece of paper, traced around it. And the next time I saw Mickey, he gave me uh, this. So this is the very first prototype of the Ronin uh, the Ronin 2, what became the Ronin 2, and literally what it is, is simply taking a Yojimbo 2, tracing it on a piece of paper, and then the only real difference as far as the, the configuration of these two, obviously with the folder, what you need is some room for the pivot pin area, 
with the fixed blade, what you need is an index for the sheath. So the handle portion mm -hmm. of it basically got moved back. The leading edge of the handle is uh, moved back a bit. So it exposes a little bit more ricasso, gives you a little bit more overall blade length. But as far as the actual profile of the two, they're identical. So that was really kind of the, <clears throat> the R&D process, if you will, for <laughs> the original Ronin. And what had happened was Mickey gave me this. I started showing off. People were like, wow, that's awesome. Is that going to be a thing? And I'm like, well, I don't know. This is a gift from Mickey. Um, I'm not really sure what the future has to hold for it. So I went to Eric Glesser at Spyderco, and I basically said, you know, because um, I was still under contract for the original Ronin going back to early 2000s. And I said, you know, according to my contract for that, I can have custom expressions of knives made. Mm -hmm. Mickey made this for me. You know, it's really cool. Some other people have expressed interest in it. They would be done as handmade custom knives. There's no violation as far as a production contract. Would that be okay? And Eric was kind enough to give me his blessing. Mickey started making some stuff. So I commissioned a few more of these, picked them up at the blade show, brought them back to the booth. And this is probably a year afterward. <clears throat> and Eric said to me, uh, hey, what'd you get? And I said, hey, remember we talked about Mickey Yurko, blah, blah, blah. I showed him one of these. And he said, uh, can I borrow one of those to stick at the prototype case? And I said, well, I just paid for these, but sure. Um, so I handed him one. He stuck it in the prototype case. We'll start picking it up. The feedback was really positive. And he's like, hey, would you like to make it a, uh, a production knife? And the rest is history. Wow. All right. Jeez, I didn't I didn't know that. So this this other gentleman, um, Mickey Ronan is his Mickey name? Yurko. Mickey okay. Yurko. Yeah. Mickey Yurko. So, so, I mean, he, in, in essence was a co-designer on this thing. Well, Mickey is a, is a custom maker. Um, so he's a career law enforcement officer, a, amazing uh, law enforcement career. He's also a longtime martial artist, been practicing martial arts for decades. And uh, he's also a custom knife maker. So you can see up close here, you can see the Yurko mark on that. If I get the yes. lighting just right. Um, so Mickey has been making knives literally for, for decades, really talented custom maker. And, uh, it was more just the idea of him kind of, uh, you know, we, we kind of barter back and forth. I give him some training. I give him some stuff. He gives me some knives. We just have a great, you know, great friendship in that way. And he decided to make me a, uh, a fixed blade of it because it is, doesn't do folders. Um, so it, he really didn't co-design it, so to speak. It was more of just kind of adapting that design to a fixed blade format. Uh, so you do a lot of training of law enforcement and martial artists and people who are, you know, interested and invested in this kind of close quarter fighting. How, what, if you were to spitball it, what percentage of people would you say in that line of work carry a fixed blade as opposed to a folder? Um, wow, that's hard to say. Um, the, when you look at law enforcement, the folks that I come in contact with as far as training and stuff like that, typically are kind of the exception to the rule. I mean, all law enforcement officers get some kind of defensive tactics training. Uh, typically, it's more of uh, just kind of comes along with the rest of the package as far as their, their training. Uh, the ones that are really serious are the ones that seek out additional training. They're the ones that show up to my seminars. Uh, in some cases, it'll be small departments that will commission me to come out and do specialized training for them. But they already are the exception to the rule. And I would say that at that point, you're talking about maybe, I don't know, one to two percent of the law enforcement market that actually seek out that additional training as far as martial arts or defensive tactics. Mm -hmm. um, when you boil that down even further and you start looking at knife carry preferences and everything, I think folders are still preferred mostly from a convenience standpoint, but um, for the, the, the officers who are really serious about like using an edge weapon for weapon retention, for handgun retention, mm -hmm. they typically tend to lean much more to, to fixed blades simply because they're easier to deploy and get into action with fewer mechanical movements. In that, in that sort of high stress environment uh, exactly. situation, it might be hard to manipulate. Well, when you think about it, if somebody's trying to grab your, your handgun, you're already engaged in a gross motor skill tug of war. So you're fighting over your handgun, and now you typically have your, your dominant side tied up in that tug of war. You're going to take your non-dominant hand, and you're going to try to open a sharp folding knife right. with one hand doing complex motor skills while you're 
doing while you're worrying work, about this over on the here. other side and you're trying not to get punched in the face while you're grabbing your gun it's it's a pretty dynamic situation whereas when you look at something like a fixed blade simple draw and it's it's much easier to get into action so you'll see stuff like the tdi knife you'll see a number of other knives that have been created specifically for that um that problem um but again as far as a number of officers who kind of embrace that i would still say it's it's pretty much a minority. A lot of them, sadly, will carry a knife, but not really have any good training to go along with it. Um, so, of course, we do everything we can to try to solve that or, or fix that problem. Right. <clears throat> you, you mentioned a very small percentage of police officers actually seek this kind of training out or departments actually seek this tra training out. In your experience, um, are they uh, motivated to seek this kind of specialized training out after something specific has happened, maybe a couple of knife attacks, or they're seeing an upward trend in that, and, and so they, they look for a solution? Or how, how does that uh, tend to work from your angle? What's interesting about it is knives, um, especially when it comes to law enforcement, just in general terms, as far as knives are concerned, um, it's really kind of a unique thing because uh, the vast majority of departments out there will authorize the carry of a knife. So they'll typically look at it as, yes, you could carry a knife, their thought process administratively is that you're going to carry that knife because it's a tool. We want to be able to have you have the capability to cut a seatbelt if you need to, or just from a utilitarian standpoint. Mm -hmm. But once you carry that, it's also uh, a lethal weapon, potentially lethal weapon. So now what you have, when you look at law enforcement training across the board, you have the continuum of force as far as law enforcement is concerned, going from verbal commands to, you know, empty hand tactics to uh, pepper spray to impact weapons like, you know, collapsible batons to tasers to firearms. Well, the knife kind of falls right in there at the same point as a firearm, but it's not considered to be part of their training continuum. So when you look at all those other tools, they have specific protocols that they've gone through. The department has done its research and they said, okay, this is our curriculum for the use of a uh, tactical baton. So they do a Monadnock program or they do an ASP program or whatever else it might be. And they embrace that particular curriculum. And along with that curriculum comes all of the solutions for legal liability. So whatever the use of force is, when you get to that point in the continuum, you know, you deploy the weapon, you use it in accordance with your training. And therefore, the, the administrative side of things, the liability side will stand behind you. If suddenly the knife comes out, there's no training that goes along with that. So you're kind of off the charts, if you will. And what it becomes is what they call an officer survival situation. So there are documented cases where officers have used the, the old, the big radios as striking implements. They've hit people with radios. They've hit people with flashlights. And those weren't necessarily trained responses. But once the officer is literally in kind of the same thing that we would have as a self-defense situation where they're in fear for their life, they really don't have any other purpose design tools that they could bring into play and they have to improvise. That's where the knife kind of falls, falls into play. And for the, the departments, um, they really don't want to pay for another program. They really don't want to um, have to maintain another uh, credential as far as currency in, in a particular system or anything like that, where law officers have to go for annual recertification. So they have to do that for taser. They have to do it for baton. They have to do it for defensive tactics and all this other kind of stuff. They don't want one more thing. So from a practical standpoint, it kind of makes sense from a functional standpoint for the officers who kind of embrace the idea of using edge weapons as part of their defensive tactics, um, they're on their own, very much so. So it becomes something where they kind of have to look at what, what they feel would work best. And again, those officers that seek out that training are already kind of the exception to the rule. Would you say, uh, in your opinion, that it might be a matter of optics that local politicians and sheriffs and other political, um, more political bodies on the law, law enforcement spectrum might find something unsavory about learning about knives because it's so close up and so brutal and kind of visceral, whereas a, 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 a firearm or a taser is a little bit more detached? Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's another aspect of it. So from the pragmatic standpoint, from the administrative and cost-based standpoint, from the the training recertification, all those things kind of um, 
way against the idea of using knives, but certainly if an officer was forced to use a knife, mm -hmm. that would also be under close scrutiny. And of course, the way that things are going these days, the media, you know, has law enforcement under a magnifying glass. So they're going to look at anything that they can uh, manipulate to try to paint, paint them in a, a less than favorable light. So certainly that part of it is also uh, very, you know, very valid observation. The optics are not good. Uh, so for those who might not be familiar with your work or haven't listened to the to other podcasts, uh, break down martial blade concepts uh, in, in a general sense. What are you teaching people when you when you show up to teach this course? So martial blade concepts, in a nutshell, what it is, is I've taken techniques from the Filipino martial arts. Filipino martial arts have one of the most advanced edge weapon cultures in the world. Basically taken proven tactics and adapted them to the needs of modern self-defense. And what I mean by that is when you look at the battlefield application of the Filipino martial arts, what you have is an application of skill that is geared toward lethality, geared toward killing, geared toward winning on the battlefield. When you look at that in the sense of justifiable self-defense and the scrutiny that you'd be under as far as justifying your actions, as far as legitimate self-defense, uh, two very different worlds, two very different uh, sets of rules of engagement, if you will. So what NBC focuses on is taking proven skills and tactics, adapting them to the needs of modern self-defense. And one of the key things that we do is we focus on stopping power. And what I mean by, by that is essentially shutting down the threat as quickly as possible to keep you safe. And in the process, um, also doing it in a way that is, again, legally justifiable. So we focus a lot on understanding uh, the medical aspects of using a knife in self-defense and really dispelling a lot of the myths that surround traditional knife tactics. So you mentioned stopping power and, you know, it, uh, I've heard you mention that before. The first thing I think of is the 45, you know, 45 caliber pistol, a pistol created for uh, uh, our occupation of the Philippines. I think it was to put people down, you know, stopping power. It will put people down. What do you mean by stopping power when you talk about a knife? Well, stopping power, the, the first of all, your comparison to stopping power with a firearm, that's perfectly accurate. And that also is one of the things when you look at legalities, when you look at the ability to um, justify your actions in self-defense, what you have to do is kind of take a look at the legal system and see what are their buzzwords, what, what are their mm -hmm. performance criteria, if you will, as far as being able to justify your actions. So when you look at stopping power, essentially what that is, is the ability to definitively stop the other person from trying to kill you. So what you're doing is essentially shutting down their capacity to be a lethal threat to you. And with a knife, what that means is you have to look at how the knife works most efficiently to achieve that goal and then understand human anatomy to, to be able to apply it appropriately. Uh, so in this in this case uh, for martial blade concepts, and I don't mean to uh, I don't mean to take a quick and dirty look at it, but I know you do a lot of uh, kind of leg techniques, things that might stop an aggressor from actually advancing on you. Um, as, that to me sounds like um, you know ha having done a bit of kali, you know I know it can get pretty nasty and vicious with the targeting and the repeated cuts and such. Um, is this is the concept of stopping power in martial blade concepts uh, more aimed towards um, I don't know maybe a less lethal approach or is that not a consideration? It, it certainly can be. Um, again, what the way that we represent it is that stopping is our is our goal. So what's interesting is when you know uh, you've got a very strong Filipino martial arts background, you've done Filipino edge weapons training, so you're familiar with the concept of defanging the snake. So you hear that a lot in the Filipino arts. Basically, the, the hand, the weapon-wielding hand is the snake. The weapon itself is the fang. If you could take the fang out of the snake, then what you've done is you've limited the, uh, the damage to you. Well, what's interesting when you look at traditional Filipino tactics, again, the battlefield application of this, let's say somebody's you know, swinging an angle one at you and you decide, okay, I'm going to do my crusada. I'm going to cut his flexor tendons with my knife. The Filipino battlefield application, the traditional martial application of it, 
would be to do that cut, ideally, you defang the snake, he drops his weapon, and then your follow-up is now to close in and finish off by targeting the neck, you know, stabbing to the torso, whatever else it might be, and essentially administering the finishing blows hmm. that in a self-defense situation take you from justifiable self-defense to assault with a deadly weapon to attempted murder to potentially murder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So what you've done is, again, you know, by training in the traditional cultural sense, you're preserving the cultural aspects of the Filipino martial arts. But if you actually fight that way and if you apply your yeah. skills that way, certainly you survive. But it also very purposely puts you on the wrong side of the law as far as defending your actions in self-defense. Once you eliminate the lethal threat, you're no longer justified in using a lethal weapon against that unarmed person. Right. So, and, and that's funny. I'm sorry to interrupt you. That's funny no. that you say that and put it that way because... Um, you know how when you're when you're repeating a motion over and over and you're encouraged to put your own finishing moves on whatever uh, whatever you're doing and you do that over and over and over again, you sort of build up a muscle memory. Absolutely. And, and the thought of going totally caveman and going back to muscle memory in, a, in an actual situation when you're not in a dojo with your friends you know, uh, who are cooperative and you're just learning this thing because it's fun and you're actually cutting a human, uh, it can go from self-defense to murder in an instant. Oh yeah, absolutely. And especially again, when you look at the traditional tactics, if you were taking those and putting them into, like if you took the traditional Filipino martial arts and say, okay, we're going to teach um, military guys. Okay. That's perfectly appropriate because if you had a military, if you had a soldier who is fighting with a knife, first of all, he's having a bad day because he should have a lot better tools at his disposal. So if he's down to using a knife, something's gone wrong. But at that point, he's basically duty bound to essentially kill the other guy, whoever the enemy is, um, because of the rules of engagement, because of, the, because of the context he's in. That idea of engaging somebody, and if you're able to disarm them, continuing on and, and essentially finishing the job, killing that unarmed person it makes perfect sense because you're duty bound. You're an authorized perpetrator in, in, that, yeah. in that context. When you look at it in self-defense, um, even a lot of the tactics, when you look at like stabbing to the torso, okay? So one of the things when you look at stopping power, a lot of people will say, okay, I'm gonna do again, my, my crusada, whatever it is, and I'm gonna move in and I'm gonna stab this guy in the torso and I've eliminated the threat. What's interesting about the modern world is you look at YouTube, you look at live leak, you look at a lot of these video sites and everything. You can find plenty of examples of people getting stabbed on video because of closed circuit TV, people with cell phones, everything else. So seeing the behavior of somebody who's being stabbed, that should be a big clue to us if we're trying to use a knife in self-defense. So if you stab somebody in the torso or you see somebody who is stabbed in the torso and they drop immediately, then it's like, okay, that's an effective tactic. Mm -hmm. But if you see somebody being stabbed repeatedly and they're still fighting and they're still upright, then it's like, wait a minute, this doesn't work the way I was told it, it does. You know, my instructor said that once you do that, I stabbed this guy, he burst into flames, we're done. You know, that's, that's it. But it doesn't work that way. And what you need to do, the, the logic of MBC, the, the compelling logic that we teach is, first of all, you're going to fight with the knife you actually carry. So I've actually been in Filipino martial arts seminars where I've pulled out, you know, a Spyderco Delica trainer or a Spyderco Endura trainer and been doing their stuff and especially doing knife disarms. And I had the host come over and politely tell me it's like he hands me a big 12 inch long dagger and he's like, here, use this instead because our techniques don't work against that. You can't do the disarms. You can't do all the strips against a tiny little knife. And I'm like, okay, uh, we're kind of suspending reality here. I'm sorry, you know. So we look at it, first of all, you're going to fight with the knife you actually carry. So whatever you have in your pocket, whatever you can legally carry, that's what you're going to have. So your training should be oriented around that weapon. Secondly, you need to quantify the destructive power of that knife. So you need to know what kind of damage it can actually cause. How deep can it cut? What kind of wounds can it inflict? And then what you do is you say, okay, now I want to focus on stopping power. I need to accept the fact that stopping power is my goal. So what I need to do is understand human anatomy so I can take the knife I'm going to actually carry, the type of damage that it can cause, and translate that to the human body and know which portions of the body I need to target to achieve stopping power. So those are the basic elements of, of logic in NBC. And when you apply it that way, what it does is it changes your targeting pretty dramatically, especially when you think of, because uh, our least common denominator, we look at a two and a half inch blade as the 
are kind of our worst case scenario. So if you live in Chicago, you live in Boston, you work in a federal building where two and a half inch blade is, is all you can have. We want to be able to have tactics that work effectively with that. Ideally, we want a longer blade if we can get it. But if you're stuck with that as your least common denominator, then you should still have tactics at work. So what you look at is what parts of the body are vulnerable to a two and a half inch blade and the types of wounds that it can inflict and will produce instantaneous stopping power. Uh, you indicated um, that it's a good idea to test to see what the knife that you carry on a daily basis is capable of, um, you know, including what kind of wounds it can create and that kind of thing. How do you suggest people go about doing that? Like, do you, do you advocate um, training against like meat dummies and that kind of thing? What we do is uh, I developed a training that, or a, a demonstration target, if you will, uh, back when I taught my first public seminar back in 1997, I wanted to show this stuff and show it in a way uh, that would allow people to kind of grasp what what the destructive power of a knife was. So we call it pork man. Basically, if you get about uh, a five pound, uh, ideally pork tenderloin, a pork roast will work, but a pork tenderloin is even better because the, the consistency of the meat is more... Uh, uh, more homogenous as far as the, the the fibers of the meat. And what we do is butterfly that down the middle, uh, take a dowel rod, three quarters to one inch thick dowel rod, put that in the middle and then tie it on with butcher's twine. So a bunch of uh, wraps of butcher's twine. And then we wrap it with about 30 layers of saran wrap and then tape the ends. So what you end up with is essentially a piece of meat wrapped around something that represents bone, covered in something that pretty much replicates skin. That ended up being about the size of your bicep tricep, the thicker part of your forearm, or our third target is actually the quadricep muscle, the front of the thigh, right above the knee. And what it allows you to do is to take that target, take the knife you actually carry, we put a pair of jeans over the top, and then what you do is you cut and you see what type of wounds you can inflict, what type of depth you can achieve with whatever blade you might be carrying. And then again, we go back and translate that to the human body. You go into Gray's Anatomy, you look for, especially for the cross-sectional mm -hmm. um, illustrations of the body. So if you looked at a cross-section of the human forearm and you said, okay, cool. So I've got, you know, radius and ulna here and I've got the, the, the radial artery and I've got the radial nerve and I've got the flexor tendons and all this stuff. You look at essentially what all those, those things are, what the depth is, and then you translate that to the type of depth that you can achieve in, in cutting pork man. And that allows you to um, really very accurately predict the types of wounds that you can actually inflict on those parts of the body. It's, those it's are primary targets. <clears throat> it can be really, really shocking to see what, um, you know, uh, most of us listening right now or watching right now, we're knife collectors. We like knives for, for their various qualities. And um, maybe some of us think of carrying them as weapons. But when you actually take a three inch knife especially one ground so thin and so sharp like they are today with a lock and you actually take a swipe at a piece of meat it is shocking to see the kind of damage you can do just with an average everyday little knife yeah a sharp blade cuts with amazing efficiency especially when you understand the mechanics of cutting once you get to the point of, of truly understanding um how to deliver an effective cut it becomes almost effortless. You can cut with really profound effect and not have to work very hard at it. And especially when you have, I mean, you've proven and shown this time and time again, especially when you have that straight edge leading to that point. Exactly um, right. You know, uh, yeah. any sort of or organic target, anything that's curved, uh, that, that you might be glancing away from, you just dig deeper and deeper with that. That and that's one of the other things, you know, without getting too graphic, when you think of cutting flesh, and this is one of the things, you know, when, when you cut a steak, if you're, um, if you've ever done any kind of butchering or anything like that, or any kind of, you know, preparation of game and that type of thing, when you're cutting with a knife, what you're doing is you're separating the tissue. And as you do, you have to keep cutting deeper and keep applying pressure because as the tissue gives way, the bottom of your cut gets deeper. Yeah. So what you have to do is extend down into that. And if you've only got one shot, then you want to make that action as efficient as possible, as mechanically um, effective as possible. So uh, I, I was mentioning up front that you 
uh, trained uh, earlier on in your career with Colonel Rex Applegate and learned a lot about firearms and pistols and uh, that kind of close quarter combat. What, uh, first of all, I mean, I, to me, uh, he, you know, um, well, we, we know uh, Colonel Rex Applegate for his contribution to the Applegate Fairbairn dagger um, and, and also for some of his exploits. But um, what, what is the difference in philosophy, would you say, that you gained in that close quarter pistol combat uh, as opposed to knife combat? I mean, there, there have to be some major differences, but they're happening kind of in that same space, I would imagine. They're happening in, in the same space, and, and um, the the primary thing uh, when you look at Colonel uh, Colonel Applegate's background, um, it's it's really interesting because he was had a number of different influences that all kind of pointed him in the same direction. So his uncle was uh, Gus Parrott. He was actually a uh, exhibition shooter uh, back in the 1930s, 1940s, and he taught Colonel Applegate how to shoot taught him in kind of the old school methods and everything, which in a lot of cases was basically using the body's instinctive ability to point. So again, relying on instinct, relying on what we do naturally. When Colonel Applegate was chosen to head up the close combat section for, he was actually um, recruited by Wild Bill Donovan, the, uh, the head of the OSS during World War II. So the OSS Office of Strategic Services actually started off as the coordinator of information, the COI was later renamed to the OSS. And when it was still the COI, just in its infancy, um, while Bill Donovan basically recruited Colonel Applegate to head up the close combat section. He said, he gave him a, a suitcase with $50,000 in it, said, I want you to set up a training program. I want you to learn everything there is to know about close combat and be able to teach that to our guys. So at that time, you had Fairburn and Sykes, W. Fairburn and uh, E.A. Sykes, the Brits who were famous from their exploits in the Shanghai Municipal Police. Well, they had kind of hit the end of their careers right around the time that uh, Britain was getting involved in World War II. So Britain recalled them from Shanghai and they said, you've got all this specialized knowledge and everything. We want to make you guys our subject matter experts. Um, and especially what they were really concerned about was a German invasion of, of England. Uh, so they were training the Home Guard. They were training a lot of the domestic defensive capability that the Brits had, as well as training what became the SOE, the Special Operations Executive, which was the British um, equivalent of the OSS. Well, once after December 7th, uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, the U.S. got involved in the war. The Brits and the U.S. started par pairing their resources. Essentially, Fairburn came over, started working with Colonel Applegate. Colonel Applegate also went to the U.K. and cross-trained with him and Sykes, and they started essentially trading information. And a lot of what he got as far as the shooting side of things really complemented what he already had learned from his uncle, and it just became more of a formalized curriculum. The whole idea with it was was to empower people uh, to be able to shoot effectively under stress in a very short period of time. The, the training time that they had was was very, very compressed. Um, so what they wanted to do is essentially instill confidence. And uh, in many cases, what that ended up being, uh, like with some of Fairburn's stuff, it's interesting when you take it back to the knife side of things, because you have Fairburn's timetable of death, which Colonel Applegate basically told me was, you know, the technical term is bullshit. Um, <laughs> but it was basically, it was never validated. And yet there are still knife systems that will consider that to be gospel. So it's, it's really Just interesting. Just ex ex explain what that is really quickly for people who may not have heard of this. So the timetable of death, basically in Fairburn, he, he wrote a book called All In Fighting, was later published as Get Tough. And in that, he had a thing called the timetable of death. And the timetable of death was essentially a diagram of the human body, showed all the major arteries. So when you go back to basic um, anatomy and you look at arteries carrying oxygenated blood away from your body to essentially nourish all your body parts. And then veins take it back and then reoxygenate it, make it circulated again. So arterial bleeding is always much more serious. So I pointed out carotid artery, subclavian artery, aorta, brachial artery, femoral artery, all these different arteries, and supposedly identified in there how long it would take if that artery were severed for a person to bleed to unconsciousness and ultimately bleed to death. And those numbers were wildly exaggerated. 
So like the carotid artery, we talked about five seconds after the carotid is severed that somebody would bleed to unconsciousness. Totally false. But again, what they wanted him to do at that time was, and the way Colonel Applegate explained it to me, he said, you know what, we had guys, you know, you, you might have a guy who's being trained for the OSS, for example. And last week he was an accountant. But huh. he speaks, yeah. you know, he speaks some language that, you know, is necessary for the spy mission that, that they were mounting in World War II. So he had a usable skill that they needed. And it's like, okay, now we got to train this guy. He's, he wants to be patriotic. He wants to be, you know, a good soldier, but he's not a natural born killer. So now we got to take this dude who was an accountant and make him into a killer and instill that confidence in him so that we can send him, send him to the front lines. How do you do that? You lie to him. <laughs> You basically yeah. say, if you take this knife and you stick it in the, in the German's neck, five seconds later, he's going to be dead. Okay. And what you'll see is a lot of stuff you'll see, like Fairburn had a thing, um, his matchbook trick. So there were matchbox trick. You remember the little drawer style matchboxes? Yeah. So you'd have the, that stuff. He said, if you hold one of those in your hand and you strike somebody in the head with it, that you can knock them out. <laughs> well, the thing is, you're knocking them out with your hand. But yeah. the fact that you believed that you had a weapon instilled yeah. this confidence that wouldn't otherwise be there. So there was a lot of psychology that was involved in the training in World War II to, to empower guys to get out there and, and give it their all, even with very minimal training. That's amazing. So, so yeah, you still want to stick that knife in the neck in the carotid artery. It'll take longer than five seconds, but hey, man, just getting the knife in there is the first step, right? Right. But again, what we do is just like everything else, we want to get better and smarter and rely more on scientific based things as, as we get smarter. Yeah. So when we look at everything we've done since World War II, we, we've learned so much more. There's a lot of stuff that they did. Um, again, going back to shooting, when you look at um, point shooting, the way that Colonel Applegate taught it, the way that Fairburn taught it and everything, one of the key things that they did was they accepted startle response. They basically said hmm. they, they didn't call it body alarm reaction. They didn't talk about activation of the sympathetic nervous system or any of the technical terms that came later on. But basically, when you're scared shitless, your hands fly up, you kind of turtle up, you crouch, and you square your shoulders with the target. You square up your body, so you make use of all your bilateral tools. Both eyes are looking at the target. Both ears are listening. Your hands are up, and essentially, you're in a natural fighting stance. And any kind of shooting platform that's inconsistent with that doesn't work because that instinct, that, that protective instinct that is hardwired into us through millions of years of evolution, that's always going to take priority. So instead of trying to untrain it, they would accept it, use it as a foundation and then say, OK, let's develop our technique from there. Ah, that's so smart. OK, so that explains that explains a lot in terms of shooting stance, you know, uh, uh, I did not serve in the military. My my brother-in-law, who's a Marine, uh, taught me a lot about uh, shooting pistols. And at first, um, having done martial arts and blading my body and all that, it didn't seem natural to square myself up. But uh, it makes sense. Right. When, when you look at it's interesting because you mentioned blading, you're probably shooting kind of a weaver stance. So if yeah. you're shooting with a weaver stance, it's an asymmetrical platform. You have one arm, one arm is bent, the other arm is extended. And basically what you have is isometric tension developed by Jack Weaver as part of the Southwest Pistol League, um, ended up being adopted by uh, Colonel Jeff Cooper, became basically the doctrine for Gunsight Training Academy back in the late 70s when they established that. And it, it literally became dogma for, you know, uh, modern pistol shooting for, for decades. The thing is, under stress, nobody's going to assume an asymmetrical stance. And it's interesting because when you go back and you look at um, the history of gun sight and the history of the Weaver stance and everything else, and also some of the people who kind of defected from that, uh, there was one in particular who was actually the head, uh, he was, I believe, director of training for gun sight. And he was asking Jeff Cooper, where are our proven applications, the combat applications of our technique? And all of the examples that were cited were essentially SWAT teams. They were essentially um, situations where law enforcement officers knew that something was going to happen with some degree of forewarning. So they were able to assume a stance, but not spontaneously. So when you're a SWAT team, and you're making an entry and that's your shooting platform. OK, great, because you knew in advance they were going into this house. 
But what's interesting is when you would see examples of officers, again, once we started getting dashboard video and more and more closed circuit TV stuff, you'd have officers who were trained to shoot weaver stance who would revert to an isosceles simply because under stress, they square their body. They were still trying to do the same thing. They had their hands together, but they couldn't assume an asymmetrical stance. They couldn't blade because instinct wouldn't let them. That's so interesting. I mean, it, it makes, it makes total sense. Uh, I, I, okay. So guilty pleasure kind of video I like to watch on YouTube are, um, close combat. What you What's that? Guilty pleasure videos. You gotta be careful what you say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, on YouTube, uh, close combat, you know, drug deal gone wrong. You got a pistol, these kind of things where, where guys are wrestling, uh, in an elevator, for instance, and a gun comes out. Is this is this the kind of thing? Is this the kind of uh, situation you train for? And I don't necessarily mean the drug deal, but I mean the 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 grappling with the gun kind of thing. Um, as far as grappling with the gun, that that aspect of kind of both sides of that. So um, I know we're on a knife podcast, so the knife guys may be wondering why are you guys talking about guns, but you know, <laughs> why not? With us anyway. Um, Marshall Blade Concepts is what I'm best known for. And it's it's the business name. And back when I started teaching, I didn't think that anyone really cared about my approach to empty hand stuff or my approach to stick or my approach to anything else. I thought I had something good as far as the knife stuff goes. And it was, in my opinion, one of the things that was kind of missing in the market was a good practical approach to defensive use of the knife. But it's not the only thing I do. So I also do the shooting side of things as well. I don't really teach that publicly. It's more for my private students who've kind of worked with me through NBC. But we also have a thing called counter gun concepts. So that's essentially disarming people from close range with guns. Um, and that goes hand in hand with handgun retention if you have a concealed carry permit and you carry a gun. So we always try to look at both sides of the coin, just like with martial blade concepts, we have counter blade concepts, which is the empty hand defenses against knife attacks. Um, so that's one of the other curricula that we teach. When, when I look at certifying instructors, I have an instructor development program and my instructors, basically they have to learn NBC and CBC. Those two go hand in hand and that becomes the core curriculum of what we do. But we also have a cane program. We have uh, mm. The, the shooting side of things, the, the counter gun concepts, which is the gun disarming um, and an empty hand system. So all that stuff is, is we consider the, the, the complete package. Well, uh, so all of this stuff, when added up, makes you the perfect candidate candidate to be the special projects coordinator for Spyderco. Uh, you do a lot of work in more specialized applications with knives. Uh, um, you know, Spyderco is known for their, you know, incredible lineup of all sorts of knives, EDC kind of chief among them. Uh, but there are a lot of uh, other more specialized knives there. How did you get involved with Spyderco? And how did you get yourself into this, um, you know, pretty specialized position? Well, first of all, special projects coordinator is a very purposely ambiguous term because uh, I kind of applied for a job that didn't exist and I got it is, is kind of the best way to explain it. Um, so what had happened, my, my original uh, contact with Spyderco actually goes back to when I first started writing for the Knife Magazines. So um, early to mid 90s was writing for the magazines, wrote for Tactical Knives Magazine during its entire 20 year run. So writing for those magazines, I had the opportunity on several occasions to do product reviews of Spyderco Knives. And Spyderco's marketing team uh, saw the articles, they liked the articles, they reached out and they said, you know, hey, if, if you're interested in seeing any more of our knives or doing any more reviews, you know, please let us know. So I ended up having a relationship with them as, as a writer for the magazines at first. And the fact that they're in Colorado, I was living in Colorado working for Paladin Press at the time. So, I mean, we were literally just down the road from each other. And... Um, Sal Glesser, the founder of Spyderco, um, very interested in martial arts, has trained martial arts his entire life. And he went to James Keating's Riddle of Steel mm. and trained with James Keating, happened to go there at the same time that another guy, another Coloradoan uh, named Bert Locke went there. And they ended up meeting each other, trained with each other. Sal came back and he was really enthused about having Spyderco start some kind of an edge weapon training program. He wanted to call it martial blade craft. 
So he talked to Bert Locke and he said, you know, you're working on uh, getting instructor credentials under Jim Keating in the ComTech program. Uh, would you set up this program and we'll essentially give you a place to, to train people? So Bert set up the initial program um, and they had a, a small training facility actually in the factory outlet store and they would run classes there. And Bert ended up moving up to um, up to Montana, I believe it was when he was leaving. Sal asked him, hey, is there anybody that you could recommend to take over the local program? And I had worked with Jim Keating and Bert Locke on a Keating video that we've done for, for Paladin. So I got a chance to meet Bert. We got to play a little bit and everything. And he's like, hey, there's this guy, Mike Janich, who works for Paladin. You might want to consider talking to him. And at this time, basically uh, myself and also Bram Frank, we were both kind of affiliated with Spyderco. We didn't work for the company, but we were both... Um, affiliated, working on designs with Spyderco, and Spyderco was kind of supporting some of our training. Um, ultimately, Spyderco decided that the Marshall Blade Craft program would focus primarily on my curriculum. Mm -hmm. So I started teaching out of Spyderco's headquarters and taught from about uh, late 1999 till about, I think the last class I ran at Spyderco was maybe early 2004, something like that. Um, but taught for them for that entire time, got to know Sal, got to know a lot of the, the management team at Spyderco and had a really positive relationship. Um, around that time, I got an offer to go work for Masters of Defense, Blackhawk Products Group. So I ended up leaving Paladin and was going to work for a competing knife company. So I talked to Sal and I said, uh, you know, Sal, I, I want to stay friends, but it doesn't make sense for me to teach for Spyderco and to work for another company It'd be a conflict of interest. So he said, okay, let's definitely stay friends. Uh, I chose to change the name of my system from Marshall Blade Craft to Marshall Blade Concepts to emphasize kind of the conceptual aspect, but keep the same acronym. Spyderco kept the Marshall Blade Craft term. Mm -hmm. I worked for Blackhawk for five years. Uh, in 2009, they kicked me to the curb and basically I was looking for an opportunity. So I called up Spyderco and I said, you know, hey, I'm, I'm looking for an employment opportunity. I've got some skills that I think might be of use to you. Um, could I come in for an interview? And basically I went in for an interview with, with the management team and they're like, okay, what, what do you think you have to offer? And I said, well, I've kind of done my own analysis of where Spyderco's at and what you do. And it's like, you know, you have a beautiful catalog. The, the copy, the technical side of the copy could use some polishing. I think my writing skills could really be of, of use to you. Um, your photography is beautiful, but it's all very artistic and kind of surreal. You don't have anything that's kind of tactically oriented. I could do photography for you. I could do video production. I did video production for Paladin Press for 10 years. I could also do product design. And if you wanted to embrace NBC again as part of your curriculum uh, to be able to offer defensive mm -hmm. classes to people, I can offer all that. So essentially made them a proposal. And I was fortunate enough for them to, to want to bring me on board. So they created uh, a position for me and they said, what, what should we call it? I said, how about special projects? Well, what is that? It's like, I really don't know, but no, no one else will either. So <laughs> and, and it sounds damn cool, man. It sounds great. And if you decide that it's something different next week, it doesn't matter because I don't have a job description. So. So the Yojimbo and the Yojimbo 2, I'm going to talk about the Yojimbo 2 because I never had uh, the first iteration um, a very uh, a, a knife very much optimized to um, the concept you've you've spoken uh, to with MBC. So very tactical in in its its genesis. But were you at at all surprised by how widely adopted this knife has been across the board for you know? most uh, average everyday users love that knife. Uh, what? How do you account for that? Uh, what's interesting about it, I think, you know, when you look at knife design, and especially when you look at blade profiles, it's very difficult to come up with something that hasn't been done already. I mean, knives have been around for a long time and I'm a big fan of history. You can see I've got my library behind me. I love to read and I love to learn about the history of edge weapons, and knives and different designs and everything. So when you look at stuff, um, it's, again, very hard to come up with something that's brand new. And when you go back to the Warncliffe design, the Warncliffe as a pocket knife design basically traces its history back to the early part of the 19th century. So it's been around for a long, long time. And when I uh, essentially 
the way that I kind of figured out that the Warncliffe was what I wanted to do from a tactical standpoint was uh, when I had a chance to de design uh, a knife actually for a custom knife maker named Mike Snowdy, the original Ronin fixed blade, um, I kind of went back to the drawing board. I designed one knife by that time, the, the Tempest for Masters of Defense, and I designed it based on what I thought I knew. It was kind of a buoy design. Yeah. Um, I remember that it, knife. It's it's what I thought, you know, we, we it's, it's what I thought a fighting knife ought to be. I was wrong. Once I started doing pork man stuff, it's like, wow, this doesn't work nearly as well. And then when I started doing some cutting with stuff that had a straight cutting edge, specifically Spiderco Frank Senefande designs. Oh. Okay. What I found was they cut with tremendous power, and even shorter blades cut deeper than bigger blades that had different different edge profiles. So once I started to kind of wrap my head around that, started to understand the mechanics of it, especially once I started making trainers and working with my partners, because when you work with different trainers, especially on the receiving end of that, you feel what the knife feels like when it's cutting. If your partner's doing his job, you're doing sombrata, you're doing whatever it might be and you're doing a flow drill with contact, when you have a trainer that really hangs on and is going to cut all the way to the tip, you feel it. So that sensation was also a big part of, you know, kind of landing on the straight cutting edge. Well, then what I did was I backtracked and I said, okay, where did this come from? Historically, where has it been used before? And I found the references to the Warncliffe blade. And I said, okay, it's, it's been done. And the original Warncliffe was designed as a utility blade. So when I designed the Ojimbo 2, you know, people are like, oh, well, that's a purpose designed fighting knife. And I'm like, well, it looks an awful, like, awful lot like a Stanley utility knife that you buy yeah. at Home Depot. And they're like, yeah, you're right. And I said, what's cool about it is if you had a splinter, you could pick that splinter out with the tip. If you needed to do something that was like using an X-Acto knife, if you're cutting, you know, poster board or whatever else it might be where you need yeah. that scalpel like precision, you can choke up and do that. But if you back off and you cut with the heel of the blade, now you're cutting with real power. And people started to look at it and say, well, wait a minute, you know, this this blade design has a lot going for it. It's, it's very versatile. And it's like, yeah, it, it does everything that I wanted to do from a defensive standpoint. But long before I was ever born, it was designed for utilitarian use. And again, when you look at, you know, the stuff you find at Home Depot, it's designed exactly the same way. I mean, it's not reinventing the wheel. I'm simply adapting that wheel to something that has a different, different stated purpose. Uh, it, it's funny you mentioned um, the utility application because, uh, you know, I have the Yojumbo, I have the Yojimbo. They're some of my favorite knives. And uh, the Yojimbo I have used many times on my little cutting board here when I'm doing projects with my, my girls. I have two young girls and they're, they always have some sort of uh, poster or project they have to put together for school. And, uh, you know, though I'd like to imagine that this is here for defending the family, it's there for that, but it's also there for, you know, making sure they get good grades too, you know? If you've ever used an X-Acto knife, you know, for, for any kind of utilitarian stuff, art projects, whatever else it might be, and then you pick up a Yojimbo, it's going to be like, oh, same thing. I mean, Except it has the going to last on this forever, you know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. As opposed. So uh, then I got the Yojumbo. I got this, uh, well, about a year ago at this point. And uh, I love this knife. Just just tell us real quickly why why this. You have the, the, uh, the Yojimbo and then you have the Ronin, which is squarely in the middle size wise. And then you, you went all the way up to the four inch Yojumbo. And I've always been a four inch knife fan and carrier. Um, <laughs> And again, this, just just for clarity, what's what's interesting about it is when you compare the Yojimbo with the Ronin. So again, this is the original Snowdy Ronin, but it's the same with the the Spiderco version. Uh -huh. The profiles on these are literally exactly the same. Okay, so what's interesting is it looks like this one is uh -huh. bigger simply because the Ricasso is exposed. Right. So because the handle on this one goes further forward, it seems as if you've got a bigger knife. But I mean, literally, if you lay these, you're right one right over the other, it's the same exact profile. So it's kind of an optical illusion that this one seems bigger. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Okay, so I guess I guess the Ronin has a little bit more in the way of cutting edge, like you said, uh, about a half an inch. But when you when you actually overlay it, yeah, it's perfect. It's the same exact, uh, same exactly. exact size. Yep. So cool. 
So when it came to the Ojumbo, and what I'll do is I'll kind of show off. These just hit the street um, last week, I believe. Oh, um, this is the all-black Yojumbo. So this is the one that I have uh, laying here on my desk right now. So it's literally the same thing that you have. The only difference is uh, a DLC, Diamond Light Carbon Coated Blade. So it's still CPMS 30V with a black DLC coating. And then all the other hardware is also black coated. Uh, so it's all blacked out. But literally the same knife that you have in your hand, uh, just non-reflective. Yeah. But what, what I found, there is no one size fits all when it comes to knives. Okay. So you'll have people who will be like, you know, well, that knife, it's, you made it wrong. The ergonomics are all wrong. And it's like, it's like going into a shoe store, you're a size 10 and you try on a size 12 and it's like, these shoes suck. No, they don't. They're the wrong size. Okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they don't fit your feet. So this is, you know, a, an organic thing. Your hands are an organic thing. So when you put an inanimate object in your hand, it's either going to feel good or not. And unless you have such a boring design, like a dowel rod, you know, okay, it fits every size hand because there are no contours to it. There's no details to the ergonomics. There's nothing, nothing there that makes it special. That, that is one size fits all. But once you start adding anything to the design that includes any kind of finger grooves, includes any kind of texturing or anything of that nature, it's always going to be subjective. Some hands, it'll feel comfortable. Other people, it won't feel comfortable. So the feedback we started to get from people was, hey, I love the Ojimbo. I love the concept behind it, but it's too small for my hand. Mm -hmm. Some other people were like, you know what? I understand. It's like when I designed the Yojimbo 2, what I wanted was a knife that closed was literally the same size as a Delica 4. So I wanted to be able to carry it in my back pocket if I wanted to, but right. I wanted uh, a longer cutting edge that was still Colorado legal. So Colorado is a three and a half inch blade length limit. This comes out at about 3.2. And some people were like, I don't have that concern. I can carry a larger blade. I want a larger blade and I want a larger handle. So that's essentially where it came from. Man, I'm so glad. Uh, I'm so glad it did. You know, I, I recently had an M4 version of the Yojimbo. I wanted it for a long time. I saved up. I got it. And then in a moment of weakness, I ended up selling it. Uh, and now I'm regretting that. And I just hope that Blade HQ comes out with an M4 version of the Yojimbo because, man, I... I, I think this is the perfect expression of this design. I love it in that four inch uh, blade size. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they did because Blade HQ is, is, you know, very, very ambitious as far as their exclusives and stuff like that. So it wouldn't surprise me if you saw something like that sometime. Okay. So uh, you've got a three and a quarter inch in the Yojimbo. Anything, anything smaller? W would it be possible to make a, Yo, a mini Yojimbo? Well, I, I think you were hanging around the prototype case at the Blade Show. So you saw what I actually did was we had requests from some people. Again, when you look at blade length and all that kind of stuff, two and a half inches is also kind of a magic number. As I mentioned before, if you live in Chicago, if you live in uh, Boston, um, two and a half inches is the, the maximum blade length allowed in some areas where they're just more restrictive. So one of the things that I've traditionally done, because I have family, I grew up in Chicago, I have family in Chicago, um, and my daughter used to live in Boston. So what I used to do is grind down Yojimbos to create what we call a Chicago Jimbo. Um, <laughs> so basically, this. what you got is, again, it's the same as a Yojimbo. It literally starts off as a Yojimbo so cool. too. But what I do is I shorten the blade to two and a half inches. So now what I've got, when I would go to those areas, when I go visit my daughter, go visit my mom, um, what I would do is take the Ojimbo 2 out of my pocket and pop this in my pocket. So now everything that I have as far as ergonomics and everything else all works exactly the same way. The only difference is the blade is shorter. So it's yeah. like, you know, carrying a snubby revolver instead of a, a longer barrel. Uh, but all the, the operating aspects of it, all the ergonomics are still the same thing. Well, for some people, they're like, okay, that makes sense, but I really don't need the extra handle. Just give me a smaller platform overall. Hmm. So what I did was I literally took a Yojimbo 2, took it to the grinder, popped a beer, took a sip, started grinding, <laughs> a sip, started grinding and I essentially scaled it down. So what, what that does is it keeps what's called the cockpit. When you look at 
essentially the, the key characteristics of the dimensions from the pivot pin to the stop pin uh, to the lock bar, and then also the, the trademark round hole for Spyderco, all those things stayed in the same place. So nothing got too small to where it was difficult to operate. Right, right. And I essentially shrunk the entire knife around those key dimensions uh, to create what will probably be called a micro jimbo. Ah, oh, yes. And so uh, the whole idea being, if you're used to carrying a Yojimbo, you get a micro Jimbo and everything works exactly as planned, exactly as you're used to. You just have a little less down here and a little less up here. Exactly. It scales it down around the, the central portion of the knife. And uh, again, that was that was shown at the uh, at the blade show. So one of the things that's unique about Spyderco is that we actually take our concept models, we take our prototypes, we take those two trade shows, and we allow people to to view them. We can't show pictures or anything like that, or we don't allow people to take pictures. Right. But what we do is we get feedback from from our customers. You know, they look at something, they may see a custom design from a maker that they're really crazy about. They may see a design that, for whatever reason, just kind of you know, piques their interest. And that's how we get our feedback and decide essentially how to prioritize our uh, R&D products and, and develop, you know, what do we develop first? What people seem to uh, like the most and what resonates the most with them. Right. God, that's so smart. And I, I, I think that if the micro Jimbo comes out or when it comes out, I think people are going to be falling all over themselves trying to pick that up. I think it's going to be well received. I mean, it's for some people, when you look at, you know, uh, even the Ojimbo, they're like, wow, that, that looks kind of scary. Um, when you have something that is just kind of smaller overall, even though the the aesthetics of it are not that different, it just kind of tempers that a little bit and it makes it a little bit more socially friendly. It doesn't seem as imposing. All right. So uh, just in wrapping up, we've talked a lot about uh, Marshall Blade concepts and uh, we talked a bit about fighting and that kind of thing and, and knives as weapons. Um, what, what kind of, uh, what kind of, I don't mean to be a buzzkill, but what are the kind of things you can say to someone now to bring them back to earth uh, when, when it comes to the realities of carrying knives as a weapon? One of the things that you need to take into consideration is the legal system is biased against knife users. And the reason for that is most of what the legal system sees, most of what the medical community sees when it comes to knife wounds is based on the felonious use of the knife. So one of the things that I've done in my career is I've actually um, been an expert consultant a number of times for legal cases where knives were used uh, primarily in self-defense, but in some cases it was alleged self-defense that on once you analyze it, it was pretty clear in, in reconstructing the events that it wasn't a legitimate use of self-defense. So what's interesting is to sit down and read um, uh, a coroner's report of somebody who was killed with a knife and to read the inferences that exist in the coroner's report as far as that goes. So like they'll talk about defensive wounds. If there are any wounds on the hands at all, and then it's followed by wounds to the body, these are considered defensive wounds. And therefore the person wielding the knife was the offender. So regardless of context, once you have those terms kind of established and especially well established in the legal community and the medical community, everyone's perspective is kind of tainted. Um, so they, they really have this skewed thing where you can, you know, explain, I did this, I did this, you know, I'm trying to justify your actions as much as you possibly can. But if what you did, one of the ways that we kind of presented at NBC is we want our work product to look different than a criminal knife attack. Mm -hmm. OK, so one of the interesting things you'll see a lot of systems out there that will focus on thrusting multiple times. So it's like you tie up with somebody, stab, 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 you know, and it's just these repetitive stabbing wounds. Well, that's what a criminal knife attack looks like. That's what a coroner's report is going to look like. OK, so if you're saying, hey, you know, this guy attacked me, I was forced to defend myself. I was in fear for my life and fear of grievous bodily injury. And I defended myself with justifiable actions. Everyone's going to look at it in the medical community. They're going to look at it in the legal community and say, well, then why does this corpse look like the guy who got stabbed by a felon? It looks exactly the same. If you behave like a criminal, we'll consider you like a criminal. So what we try to do, that, that aspect of defending yourself is really tough. 
because using a knife in self-defense, as you said, is, is it's up close, it's impersonal, it's a, it's a very grisly thing to think about. But what you want to do is make it so that when you're done, God forbid you ever had to use your, your skills, what you can do is say, I did this for this reason, this for this reason, this for this reason. When the threat was stopped, I was done. I created distance. I stepped back and I was safe. What we want is that ability to have that, that clinical explanation, to take a, a really dynamic, dangerous situation and to sort it out as quickly and efficiently as possible and then be able to stay out of prison when we're done by justifying our actions in a way that is, again, what, what, when you look at the legal system, what they'll say is, what would a reasonable person do? Well, we want somebody to as easily as possible slide into our shoes and say, okay, in that situation, what you did made sense and it was legally justifiable and you had no choice and you're free to go. That's what we're trying to establish. So you're, you want to have skills, you know, as I mentioned before, defanging the snake to, to take the, the explanation of stopping power a step further. What's interesting is the Filipino martial arts, they defang the snake by mechanically doing the same thing we do in MVC. So muscles pull on tendons to move bones. The way that happens, the way that our body controls that is by the brain using nerves to trigger the muscles. So once you cut the muscles deeply enough or you cut the tendons or you cut the nerves that control the muscles, then essentially that part of the body is immediately paralyzed. It's immediately disabled. Well, we take it beyond just doing this. The next step is bicep tricep. That's what you need for coordinated motion of, of the weapon wielding arm. To be able to wield a contact distance weapon, you need to be able to bend your elbow and extend your elbow. Once we take those away, you take away the ability to wield the weapon. And that's by cutting the bicep, cutting the tricep, or cutting the nerves that literally run right between the two. And again, taking the brain's capability away so that it can't control those muscles. And then the final one is quadriceps muscle just above the knee. That's what allows you to extend your knee joint and support weight. Without that muscle, your leg collapses. You basically drop to one knee. And at that point, we call it a mobility kill. And you can back off, create distance, and keep yourself safe. So the ultimate expression of our technique would literally take away the grip on the weapon, take away the ability to wield the weapon effectively, take away the mobility, drop the person in place. We create distance back off. And at that point, we also have closure to our technique. So we're not latched onto somebody stabbing until we get tired. Right, right. And at that point, we also have the ability to then say, I did this for this reason, this for this reason, this for this reason. I stopped the threat. That was my focus. That was my intent. And it it's backs up your claim to legitimate self-defense. Well, Michael, thank you, A, for that explanation. And B, I just want to say that though most people who, you know, carry and admire your beautiful knife, the Yojimbo 2, and the others in that family, um, you know, carry them for EDC, it's nice knowing that so much thought and, and real uh, practical real world experience has gone into designing something that could also be used um, in case you ever needed to, to bail yourself out of a tough situation. So uh, um, I appreciate that explanation. And I'm sure a lot of people who don't even think about the, the martial application of the blade appreciate knowing what went into it. Well, one, one final thing, you know, people will look at the knife stuff that regardless of what system it is, they'll say, you know what, a knife is not a, it's not a practical self-defense weapon. You need to have a gun. You need to have this. You need to do this. And at that point, you get this this never-ending flow of cliches and witticisms and everything else that people throw out there. Yeah. Once you live in a place where you can't own a gun, you can't carry a gun, and the knife basically becomes your only choice as a lethal force weapon, it changes your mindset a bit. So my focus on edge weapon stuff basically really hit its peak when I was living overseas, living in countries where I couldn't own a gun. I had a diplomatic passport. I was assigned to an embassy, but I couldn't own or carry a gun. And I was going to places where there was definitely the, the threat of serious violence. So I wanted to have something that I can use to defend myself. So you have to put yourself in that context. Even all the gun guys, if there's guys out there who are, you know, um, have concealed carry permits and everything else, awesome, more power to you. Sooner or later, you're going to go someplace where you don't have reciprocity. Sooner or later, you're going to go on vacation and not be able to carry the gun with you. 
you need to have another option. And that's really where the knife comes into play. Michael Janich, thank you so much for coming back on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a real pleasure, sir. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here and would love to come back anytime. Thank you so All much right. for the opportunity. I look forward to the next time. Outstanding. Thanks. Have a knife you want featured or reviewed? Call the Knife Junkies 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and let us know. I love talking to that guy, Michael Janich. Uh, MBC, also designer of the Spyderco Yojimbo, the Yojumbo, the Ronin, and uh, many other knives across other brands. Uh, if you like interviews like this and you want to check out more, go to thenifejunkie.com and check us out. Every Sunday we have a new interview with a, well, with a luminary. What can I say? Uh, just like we had Michael Janich. Also, check out our Wednesday supplemental shows and our Thursday night live stream. So for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I am Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco saying, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.